Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar on the current impacts and future directions of the Building Safety Act. I'm Alex Clough, I'm a partner in our construction disputes team here at Michigan Devea. It was recently the seventh anniversary of the tragic fire at Grenfell Tower. As most of you will know, the building had been reclad between 2014 and 2016 with a cladding system that was highly flammable and caused the rapid spread of fire across the exterior of the building. Following the fire, then Judith Hackett led an inquiry, which concluded that the system of building regulations then in place was not fit for purpose. She recommended a new regulatory framework to address these weaknesses. That new framework was implemented through the Building Safety Act, which gained royal assent just over two years ago in April 2022. The Building Safety Act goes beyond fire safety and has an impact on the, on the safety of a building across its entire life cycle. I tend to think of the Building Safety Act as operating in three parts. The first part is the impact it has on the design and construction phase of new high-risk buildings. High-risk buildings are residential buildings over 18 metres tall. Plus, for the design and construction phase, high-risk buildings also include care homes and hospitals. These buildings fall within the remit of the Building Safety Regulator for the purposes of building control. The Building, regulator, the building Safety Regulator was set up last year and is part of the HSC. The regulator has two objectives, to secure the safety of people in and around buildings in relation to risks from buildings, and secondly, to improve building standards. The BSA seeks to achieve these objectives by requiring that new high-risk buildings must pass through three gateways at the planning, commencement of construction and completion stages. At each of these stages, the safety of the building must be demonstrated before the gateway can be satisfied. The second impact of the BSA is the implementation of new requirements for the operation phase of high-risk buildings. These include the nomination of an accountable person who is responsible for managing the safety risks of fire spread and structural failure appropriately and engaging with residents in a collaborative and responsive way. Finally, the BSA implements powerful new tools for those seeking the remediation of unsafe residential buildings and the recovery of the costs of such remediation. It's worth remembering that these provisions apply to both fire safety and structural safety. We have seen a number of claims coming through the courts and the first tier tribunal where claimants have used these new tools and I'm aware that there are plenty of claims being progressed. The complexity of the new regime has given rise to novel questions of law and I expect we'll see a steady stream of cases in the coming months and years. Now that the BSA has been enacted for over two years and the BSR has been set up for over six months, it's a great time to take a look at how the new regime is working in practice. Presenting our webinar today, we've got Kizzy Augustin, a partner here at Mishkondorea in our health and safety team. Kizzy advises clients on all aspects of health and safety and has recently been working with her clients on their obligations during the occupational phase of a building. Adriano Amarese is a partner in our non-contentious construction team, working with clients at the front end of construction projects and helping them navigate the gateways during the construction phase. Richard Gerstein is a partner in our construction disputes team and has been involved in one of the leading cases on remediation contribution orders. Finally, but most importantly, we have Chandru Disanaki from the newly renamed Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. Chandru is the Director of Regulatory Stewardship and Reform in the Safer Greener Buildings team. Thank you very much, Chandru, for joining us. We're really looking forward to hearing about your ongoing work in relation to building safety. And with that, I'll hand over to Kizzy. Thanks, Alex. Um, well, Chandru, welcome to the webinar. I think I'm looking forward to uh, diving into the BSA in a slightly different way than maybe some others have done. Um, but I don't want to discuss the black letter of the law of the BSA and its content. I hope we can take 
that has read all 250 odd pages of it. But there are some key areas that I think have really sparked some interest, particularly for those who find themselves having to meet new or extended obligations. So welcome. Thank you. Um, let's dive right in. Building Safety Act, BSA, the intention versus reality. Does it do what it's set out to do? Yes, it's a great question, right? Because um, as policy officials, we sit in Whitehall and we engage the sector seeking to try and uh, influence the behaviours of those operating in markets, driving uh, productivity and growth and uh, profit, ultimately, for the organisations they operate in. Now, in doing that, what we saw from Grenfell was often what wasn't thought about properly was the residents who inhabit these buildings long after those that design them, construct them, uh, have moved on. Uh, and so really the Building Safety Act, the intention here, uh, as Dame Judith Hackett put it, was to start to put the residents right back into the heart of thinking in relation to how you design, build, construct, and indeed manage buildings in the future. So how do you really get that counterbalance of the drive for profit, productivity and growth counterbalanced with the need to create really brilliant homes for people to live in? Because ultimately, that will also drive uh, happiness, social growth, economic growth and, uh, and well-being within our society, right? We all want a good place to live. So the intention of the Building Safety Act was just to rebalance some of that and recognising that uh, there will always be a small cadre of uh, people that uh, willfully uh, neglect their duties and responsibilities or indeed seek to act irresponsibly. And so how do you drive up the consequence in that scenario so that it detracts and or it deters those people from operating in that way? In addition to that, it's also about bringing much greater clarity as to the roles and responsibilities that we want to see uh, people take and uh, driving accountability into, into the system and improving transparency. So uh, Alex beautifully spoke about um, the two intentions of the Building Safety Act. I sort of see it slightly wider than that. I see the Building Safety Regulator and the National Construction Product Regulator as two foundation stones through which we drive cultural change across the sector and we drive behavioural change into the way people operate. That's quite interesting. Uh, sorry, sorry to cut you. Yeah, I just course. thought it was, it's quite interesting. I mean, you've mentioned quite a few things that have sparked a bit more interest in, in kind of delving deeper. You talked about Dame Judith Hackett and, you know, the comments that she made, uh, rightly or wrongly, about this regime not being fit for purpose. What what do you see as, as fit for purpose, bearing in mind, you know, in your role as Director for Regulatory Stewardship and Reform, I would I would take it that the stewardship part would include, you know, testing whether or not something is is or this legislation is fit for purpose. So, do you, th do you think that we've got it right here? Uh, don't know yet, right? So we, we're trying something and we are moving here, but we need to keep it under review and we need to be humble and have humility in the fact that it may not uh, be working as well as we would like it to in all areas. Uh, also, we may need to tighten up bits in other areas, and it will be for this new government who's uh, been appointed to really to take a look at that and decide how it wants to wants to move forward. Look, we're all interested to hear what the Grenfell Inquiry says uh, on September the 4th. Mm. Uh, we're going to need to take stock at that point, but we should also be aware that we have introduced a five-yearly review in law of the regime which means that every five years in law, ministers will need to appoint an independent person to review the regime and make sure it is operating in the way it was envisaged and also hopefully highlight areas where it can be improved. Right. So I'm not going to say that it's perfect, but I am going to say it has absolutely addressed some of the behaviours that we do not want to see out there. Right. So, um, you know, if you just take Gateway 1, when it was introduced a year and a half ago, the regulator was declining over 40% of, uh, of applications. And that was due to really badly thought out designs 
at the planning gateway stage, that has dropped dramatically and people are getting much better applications in at gateway one. Uh, and so you can start to see a change in the behavior within the se sector and the expectations. That will happen on gateway two and three, right? There, there are delays I know going on there and it's not good enough and we need to get better. But that's the job of the regulator mm. and it's the job of industry as well to change behaviours and respond to new expectations. How do we get around this idea of the demystification of, of the BSA? I, look, we've, we've all had issues and it's really quite comforting to hear you say we're all trying. You know, we're, we're trying to do the best that we, we can. I, I presume the regulators trying to do the best they can. Duty holders are trying to do the best they can to comply. But there is this idea that there's so much of the act that still slightly confusing and you know a perfect example is the identification of certain roles we've still got clients who are struggling to understand who is an accountable person who can be a nominated person for PAP you know who could perform the, the, the principal designer role and, and so on so how do we further demystify it seems like we've done a bit and as you say, applications that have come through are better and there's a bit more clarity. There's still so much shrouded in a bit of mystery. So how do we manoeuvre that? How can we advise our clients, for example, to manoeuvre that? Yeah, so look, we have published guidance on uh, the roles and who we expect to undertake the roles and who the accountable persons are. So the accountable persons actually is enshrined in law, uh, who that is. Uh, the roles, as in principal designers and others, uh, are issued in guidance. Now, within all of that, there is, you know, and I, I understand this, there will be some reluctance from those in the sector, uh, having operated under one expectation for decades, to suddenly think to themselves, actually, I've got all of this new roles and responsibilities. Am I comfortable? Am I, am I right? Okay. So I do understand that. But the truth is... Uh, even in the old regime, although it wasn't clarified, that was what was expected of you. Uh, now we've just made it much clearer and much harder. And so I know REBA are introducing principal designers for architects, uh, and they've got a scheme there which they want to introduce. And for some architects, that might be difficult for them to understand that they have these responsibilities and duties in relation to safety and to the end resident who are going to use their buildings rather than just designing the building and passing it on to someone else to, to build, right? And mm. the whole sector is going to have to get used to the fact that there are expectations which are better articulated now yeah. in legislation and in guidance that weren't before. Uh, and quite frankly, if you're not willing to take those expectations and meet those requirements, you shouldn't be in the sector. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's an element of that. And, and I remember talking to a, a particular client about uh, the construction design and management regs and when that came out and was revised um the issue around who does what became a a, a big issue um do you think if if maybe the cdm regulations had been applied and understood at the time would we have a need for the bsa yeah so cdm is specific to health and safety at work uh, for those who are working in and around the site uh, these regulations really focus on uh, the residents who end up with the building that they live in, mm. right? So CDM doesn't cover that. The Building Safety Act does, which is the point I was making right at the start of the pod, uh, of this webinar, which was, you know, this is about how do we put residents right into the decision making at the time of design, construction, and management of buildings. And do you think that we'll be having some further secondary legislation? I know you mentioned guidance, so REBA have been quite quite vocal about that. Um, is there space for further secondary legislation to help with understanding what the, the key issues are? Look, legislation is always uh, the, at the prerogative of the government of the day. And so um, I can't speak for the government as to what it may or may not decide it wants to legislate on. But what can, I can absolutely say is, the regulator and the government want this system to work well, right? We are committed to house building. Uh, there is a 1.5 million statement out there. We are committed to infrastructure build. So we want this regime to work well, but we just don't want any old house or any old building. We want good buildings that meet the requirements of the residents that live in there over the long term. Uh, and so we're committed to 
to working with industry to make sure that there is clarity out there, uh, but recognising that sometimes that clarity might not be always the way people would want it to be. Let me turn it on its head a little on the, the kind of point of view of the regulator. Yeah. Um, so we know that the BSR is part of the HSE, HSE we all know and love. Um, and I'm quite interested in the relationship between the BSR and the ministry um, and how the BSR may or may not be held to account. I think when I think of your role and thinking of stewardship and directorship and leadership, I think about allocation of resources, I think about management, I think about oversight of accountability and compliance. So what does that relationship look like in in practice? You've got the BSR, you've got an opportunity for the BSR to potentially be held uh, to account um, if a duty holder isn't isn't quite happy with a decision. Um, There's an appeal process. But what does that kind of relationship look like in practice? Yeah, so the first thing I should say is it, it's unique for a government department to have to deal with appeals, right? The, the idea here is <laughs> we want the building safety regulator to deal with things in an independent way. So operational matters should be independent of the government of the day mm. and should be undertaken by the regulator uh, according to proportionate standards and guidance, which is out there working with the sector. So, so that should be the primary route. However, Within any primary route, there should also be the ability where things aren't working for it to escalate to the department, both so that we can uh, act and resolve issues. uh, uh, And that's usually through adjusting the strategic framework or or providing more resource or or whatever it is. Uh, But also in this unique case, a bit like planning, there is the ability to appeal to the department for uh, an adjudication, particularly when timelines are breached Mm. rather than a decision being not what you like, right? So it's not about appealing to the department because you didn't like the decision. It's about appealing to the department because the timeline for making the decision was breached. Now, in that scenario, the department will uh, look to, uh, as quickly as it can, uh, resolve the issue and... uh, get to a decision as quickly as we can. But to be clear, we will still be doing that within the operational bounds, guidance, standards, which are set out there. It's not about seeking to do anything other than that, but it's just to provide a fail-safe to make sure that the department knows what's going on and we can adjust things accordingly. Now, we are uh, we, we do provide the budget for the building safety regulator through the department. The building safety regulator itself sits within the HSE, the Health and Safety Executive, and is sponsored primarily by DWP, Department for Work and Pensions. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what we have is an advisory committee which monitors and uh, has strategic oversight uh, over what the building safety regulator does specifically. And we have regular meetings with the leadership team there, both at chair, chief exec and ministerial level, to make sure that they are delivering in the way we intended. Now, I should say... You know, we are in a transition period, right? So the building safety regulator is just setting up. So with anything, there are going to be these tensions and these uh, little areas which bubble up, which aren't quite working in the way that it perhaps was envisaged or we all want. And we're committed to working with the regulator to resolve those transition issues as quickly as we possibly can. I mean, again, good to hear. I mean, it's not a new issue. Those who are familiar with the way in which the health and safety executive um, conduct investigations or even enter into discussions with duty holders, I think there's been a shift between being the helpful advisory entity and and more towards the the enforcer. And I suppose the anticipation is the BSR will be very much the same. They will act more in a, in a a kind of enforcer capacity now we've moved from all of the transition periods that we had but it's good to hear that you that there is an avenue to at least I call it hold hold the BSR um, to account and it is about those timelines I think you're right it's about those timelines it's not about appealing decisions per se but it's about the timelines where you've got duty holders who feel very 
a, a slightly aggrieved maybe that they've got lots of things to do and they've got deadlines to do them whether it be applying for notices or permission to do works and they've got eight or 12 weeks to do that it seems like when you turn things the other way the BSR don't have those timelines or, or even if they did they don't necessarily have to stick to them and I think that's where some of the concern has come from uh, certainly from a client yeah. perspective is how, how do we get around that without having to go through the very formal route of ap appealing to the Secretary of State? There's really, uh, there's a few points in there which are fascinating, right? So, so the first is, are, are we interested in the building safety regulator being productive, effective and efficient in uh, delivering decisions? Absolutely, right? We're all committed to that. But uh, equally, do we want those decisions to be of high quality Absolutely. Right. So the mistake I would suggest uh, that potentially led to some of what happened in Grenfell and what we see elsewhere in buildings is that we were too worried about speed mm -hmm. and not enough, not enough concern about the quality of the decision. Right. We cannot we cannot make that mistake again where we are chasing off the speed of decision at the expense of putting residents at risk. Right. So, so, so that is a, a no brainer of saying that that culture needs to change. Now, equally, that doesn't mean the regulator can take however long it takes. There are set timelines that it should be following. And where it's not, we as the department uh, are very keen to know. And we're sort of pushing the regulator, recognizing we're in a transition period. And in the transition period, two things happen. A regulator is gearing up to understand the role it's doing and the capacity it needs, but also the industry is beginning to understand what the regulator wants and how it needs to gear up to meet the needs which are required. Right. So there are two, it's not a it's not a sort of regulator fault or an industry fault. It's mm -hmm. two partners who need to learn how a new system works. And that takes a little while, right? Now what we need to make sure is that delays that happen are not systemically entrenched into a system in an inefficient and ineffective way. And the excuse of quality is not given for uh, really poor, ineffective decision making, right? So, so we absolutely must make sure that that is not systemized uh, within, within how this operation works. And we're keeping a close eye on that over the transition period to make sure we've got the right capability capacity. Equally, right, this should not be an excuse for people to carry on doing the same things that they have done before. This is a new regime <laughs> which requires new information. And I want to also be clear, some of the feedback I'm getting from the regulator is quite a lot of the applications which are being put in, even at Gateway 2, would not have met the old requirements, let alone the new requirements. Right. right? So the sector needs to gear up and change. Now, I also understand that there will be pressure on the sector because time is money. And when investors have put money in based on one set of expectations and suddenly the timelines get extended, that affects investment decisions. I'm hoping that will ease quickly and we will get to a point where we baseline and then we can improve from that baseline as opposed to the uncertainty which is currently existing out there because no one is quite sure how and when things are happening. I do also want to see communications between the sector and the regulator improve considerably. I and think I that will the come. There is helping as well. Yeah, I think I think that will come. I'm quite. I mean, I'm just drawn by your the passion that you have towards um, where you like to see the BSA going and the BSR going. How did you get into all of this? I often get asked, you know, did I wake up one morning and want to be a health and safety lawyer? Clearly not, because um, it wasn't very fashionable 25 years ago. But what what made you get into kind of building safety and reform? It's a it's a good question, right? So I am uh, I'm a, your typical policy wonk within uh, within Whitehall, uh, and so my skill set is probably uh, intangible and questionable. Uh, I mean that just <laughs> uh, my skill set is really about looking at systems and how you reform systems, and so I've done that across a variety of different areas previously. Uh, I was invited to join uh, this area of work when soon after Grenfell Tower fire. So in September, I was, in, I was in cabinet office at the time uh, and I was invited to join in September. So I came and joined in September uh, 2017. 
And really, it's been a huge learning curve, right? So I, I wasn't part of the sector before. I didn't know much about it before. It's been a huge learning curve, and I'm very grateful to lots of people out there that who have, who have educated me and helped me and continue to help me, right? So I also need to be clear, expertise never sits in Whitehall. Right? Uh, and so really, this is about how Whitehall engages the experts which are out yeah. there in the field and brings that expertise to bear to make sure that legislation is both fit for purpose and is being delivered in the way it was intended and the outcomes are as intended, right? So, so this is an ongoing process of partnership. It's not a, we know the answers and we are the experts. Absolutely not. It's ongoing. Yeah. yeah. And, and with that in mind, and my last question before I get my colleagues to, to pipe in as well, you don't have to answer this. <laughs> you don't want to. But do you think now that we've got a change of government, we are going to see the same level of focus and push and drive for real building safety reform? Obviously, we had um, Go Michael Gove, who was very focused on building safety. Do we think we're going to see the same focus now? What's what's your kind of hopes for the future in building safety? Look, I um, I, I um, absolutely know that the government uh, is committed to building safety and committed to making sure that every single resident in this country uh, has the ability to live in a home that gives them the best start and best opportunities in life. Uh, and I know that is absolutely uh, at for the forefront of their mind, particularly as they're starting to look at how, they, how we deliver the 1.5 million new homes. It's absolutely at the forefront of the mind. Brilliant. Thank you, Chandru. So far for your observations, don't go anywhere yet. It's not all over. Um, I've really, really enjoyed listening to your thoughts about where we are now versus where we ought to be or where we are going to be in the future. Um, as you can probably imagine, we've had varied experiences of the implementation and the operation of the BSA, both from a legal point of view, but also through the lens of our respective clients. Adriano, do you want to kick us off with some of your observations? Yeah, thanks, Kizzy. Hi, Chandru. Um, so my, I suppose my observations pick up on a couple of the themes that we've already discussed, actually, and hopefully drill down in a little bit more detail. So uh, the first observation I had relates to the new building regulations duty holder regime and specifically the role of the principal designer, which we discussed a little bit about before. And I suppose as someone who specialises in front-end procurement advice, I can see that many of our clients are really struggling to persuade their appointed architects to take on the role of the, the building regs principal designer, despite the encouragement from REBA to do so, and mainly due to concerns around competency and availability of PI cover. Now, when I look at it at its heart, the PD role, the principal design role is really about managing and coordinating design to ensure that the functional requirements of the building regulations are complied with. So it's really hard when I look at a project team to imagine that anybody on that team would be better placed than the architect to do that. But given the apparent sort of narrowing and shortage of available options, do you think that the direction of travel will inevitably be that the BSR has to take a broader view in terms of who performs the principal designer role. Uh, so in much the same way as the HSE has had to do with the, with the CDM regulations, where you know, we started off assuming that almost certainly the principal designer role would be performed by the lead designer on a project, but invariably it's ended up being, I suppose, more peripheral members of the project team. Yeah, so I think the act itself uh, remains uh, agnostic, right? Uh, and so uh, it can be whoever is responsible and takes responsibility to do it. So we are relatively agnostic in legislation. I should say REBA are absolutely certain that it should be the architect. Uh, and certainly when I look at this uh, with a lay eye, uh, it would, uh, a bit like what you said, Adriano, it, I sort of agree. Right Now, uh, you mentioned two things there which is people are reluctant because of competency and or uh, PII cover. And both are absolutely relevant. Uh, if it's competency, well, quite frankly, uh, REBA and ARB and others need to resolve that quickly. Right? And architects need to uh, be competent for the work that they are undertaking. And if they feel they are not competent, well, good. They shouldn't be doing it. Step away. Right? So really clear competency should not be compromised 
PII is difficult, right? We know the market has been hardening. It's gone through shifts and changes in the last seven years where it was easy, hard, easy, hard. And I think at the moment it's somewhere in between, right? Some Speaking to some people, they say it's getting better. Other people say it's getting worse, right? But we've got a job to do with uh, PII, which is about helping them understand how the sector manages and handles risk and how the people that are uh, taking on these roles are competent enough to take on these roles. So I do think the REBA work around having a register of principal designers or a set of frameworks and uh, continuous development around them is the right thing. I think that will help with PII. But really, what the insurance firms are really saying is, look, give us some confidence that you're competent enough to take on this jobs, this, this work, uh, and some clarity, and, and, and then we can insure you. And I hope that's the case. If that isn't the case, we certainly need to look at that space and think about how we how we loosen it a little bit. But competency must not be compromised here, right? It needs to be someone who's competent. Yeah, I agree. And looking at it through a more optimistic lens, I think what we are seeing is a greater willingness on the part of architects than perhaps we had six months ago to take on the role. And I think that's uh, probably driven by PI insurers being more amenable to, to you know, depending on terms of coverage to, to their insureds carrying out that role. And then the messaging from REBA has been really helpful, I think, in terms of reassuring um, the architect profession that actually what they're being asked to do is, as you, to your point earlier, it's what they should be doing anyway. And it's what they have been doing. So if you don't know building regulations, right, how the heck can you operate as an architect in this country? Yeah. yeah. It's just like, yeah, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, and so my, my second observation it picks up on this um, a slightly different theme, but related, of course. It picks up on the the, the the paranoia around the BSR's ability to handle and respond to the volume of applications that it's expecting. So we've been very focused on the transitional arrangements, and you, as you can imagine, there's been lots of manoeuvring and people trying to make sure that they fall into the transitional provisions to avoid the rigors of the new uh, building control system. Now we're at the other side of that. I think there's a lot of concern around, particularly on, on projects involving high-risk buildings, the potential for delays at Gateway 3, and as you alluded to earlier, the implications that that can have for project completion and occupation and the adverse implications that that has uh, economically. And as, as we discussed, where a decision hasn't been issued by the BSR within the statutory timelines, you and an extension hasn't been agreed you've got the op you have got the option to submit the non determine ap non determination application to your department but that's a slightly opaque process isn't it which doesn't really offer any guarantees in terms of, in terms of the timing and outcomes so i suppose two questions from that one is do you think clients are right to be concerned uh, about the bsr's capability at the present time do you see that improving and in reality, will, will MHCLG have the capacity to handle what could turn out to be a large volume of applications whilst any teething issues are worked out within the BSR? Look, my hope is the number of cases uh, we get are zero uh, to okay. nil. <laughs> uh, that's not to say that we won't be ready to take them on. Uh, and that's not to say that we shouldn't publish guidance on how uh, we intend to do that and uh, the timelines that we would like to hold ourselves to that. That, it, that must be good practice and that must be something we do, right? So as a department, I am not letting us off the hook. I yeah. am working my teams quite hard to work through all of that and publish stuff and do stuff, right? So I want to be, I want to be clear about that. However, like I said, I want zero cases coming to the department because the best place to make determine cases are is in the regulator that has the resources and the ability to determine those cases best so my encouragement would be for any client to work with the regulator to achieve that look uh can i can i give you cast iron guarantee over this uh, transition period that we are going through that the regulator has absolutely all the capacity and capability that it needs to deliver i can't but i'm talking to the regulator regularly uh, they are assuring me and gearing up in places. I know that there are some cases which are extending. I know in those cases, the regulator is reaching out to the clients and asking whether by mutual consent those, those cases can extend. I would encourage uh, clients to work with the regulator on that. I also know the regulator is looking at its internal processes to think about how it can work 
more effectively uh, across these, right? So, so I, I do accept there's a there's a period of uncertainty while the new regime embeds in, and we're getting the first few cases going through Gateway Three and Gateway Two. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, but I, I would encourage us to bear with the regulator uh, and make sure that we get those processes right, so that when the next cases come through, they come through quickly and easily rather than seeking to escalate immediately uh, and driving an alternative process which doesn't resolve the issues in the primary process. It's in all of our interests to get the primary processes through the regulator working well, uh, not in our interest to look narrowly at an individual scheme and think about how quickly can I get it across the line. Uh, I can assure you it will always be quicker through the regulator than going to the department. Yeah, thanks, Chandri. That's encouraging. I was also encouraged by what you said earlier as well about the quality and sophistication of the applications improving as the market becomes more, I suppose, drilled in terms of what the BSR's expectations are when it comes to applications. Yeah. Uh, there needs to be more communication as well, right, between yeah. the regulator and client uh, and the regulated. So there needs to be more communications, and I hope that improves over time as well. Yeah, and I think government has been clear about the advantages of early engagement with the BSR as well to make sure that the process is expedited and any sort of potential delays are headed off at the pass. So that's, yeah, consistent. But never at the expense of quality decisions. Right? Of course, yeah. Quality decisions are paramount. Yeah. Thanks, Chandru. Uh, Kizzy, hand back to you. Oh, sorry. Um, who's next? Alex? Was it Richard? Richard, <laughs> over to you, Richard. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Um, I'm going to take you to a completely different part of, of, of the legislation. I'm involved in advi <clears throat> advising developers, contractors and, and residents on the impact of the Act and, and some of the problems uh, that they're, they're now suffering as a result of... Um, defective cladding, def defective insulation, and, and how they get round uh, or, or how they ensure that the works that are necessary are, are, are carried out. Um, and I was quite intrigued by what you said in, in, in your introduction, because you talked about the importance of, res of, of the residents. And the one problem that I'm coming up against time and time again when I'm acting for the groups of residents who have um, cladding issues which need to be remedi remedied is that if they seek um, some, you know, justice through the courts, or in this case, through the first tier tribunal, and they go for remediation orders or, or, or remediation contribution orders, they've got no ability to recover the legal costs that they incur um, in those proceedings, which is, of course is very different from, from what would happen if they were bringing their claims uh, in the courts. Uh, is, is that something that, that is... Um, the ministry have picked up on uh, that they're aware of. Is that something that, that something might happen with going forward? Yeah. So look, um, we did think about this uh, quite hard, hard actually, uh, when we were introducing it in the act, and we felt it was a lower barrier for people to go in with certainty around their costs uh, to take action against others. Uh, rather than being left open to have to pick up uh, a part the other party's cost if they lost right so this was about how do we provide certainty to the individual leaseholder that wants to act against uh, a big corporation and not be worried about suddenly being landed with that big corporation's legal bill uh, as a result of losing their case right so there was a balance here between enabling uh, costs to be recovered versus uh, reducing the barrier to enable people to 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 to, to take costs. Uh, you know, I should be clear. We also have the um, recovery strategy unit, which is also taking. It's also acting uh, to take uh, big developers and contractors uh, to court and through the system to make sure that residents are being protected. And that sits in the department and has several cases outstanding at the moment. But hopefully, you know, as case law starts to develop and it moves up the, the different different tribunals, uh, we should see these cases become cheaper and quicker for, for, for residents. But I do I do accept that there is a 
there is a barrier at the moment, right? Because it costs to, to bring things to to court. I'm quite intrigued by that answer, uh, and the reason I'm intrigued by it is is that the other the other point that I picked up from your introduction was you were talking about unscrupulous developers, and I'm afraid in 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 my line of work, you know, when we're involved in litigation, certainly when you know there are businesses that there are there are companies there are, there are developers in particular who who might play the long game who might uh think that they can squeeze out uh the uh the individuals a small group of individuals um if if they play that long game and drag out uh, drag out the litigation drag out the the the, the court hearings whatever it's going through now they have the advantage in those in the circumstances where there's no ability for the for the residents to recover their costs. Now, whilst it should be a fairly simple process, and 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 when one appears in the tribunal, you can see conceptually that it might be. But the reality is, we're dealing with a brand new piece of legislation. It is complex. It is changing regularly as uh, uh, new legislation and, and and new statutory instruments are are introduced. Residents can't keep on top of that, so they're having to engage lawyers. They are being prejudiced, in my eyes, by the by the fact that they can't recover the costs. So actually, it seems to me it's having it's having the uh, the reverse of what you intended. Uh, it depends, right, uh, Richard? Because I am seeing residents take cases and take uh, and and win, right? So so there is a there is a you know if you can show me sufficient evidence of people who are not being able to do it. I'm really interested. I'm not saying that all legislation is all right. We, we need to keep it under review. At the same time, what I would say is uh, there is a separation between getting the works done versus pursuing those who have done the wrong thing. And getting the works done within the Act made it very clear it's the responsibility of the uh, landlord, freeholder, uh, however you like to describe it, to undertake the works uh, and it only permits those costs to be passed on to leaseholders in specific circumstances, right? So there is something here about uh, the landlord and the freeholder getting the works done. I should say as well, the building safety regulator, particularly for buildings above 18 metres, is doing the five yearly inspection, right? So uh, at some point, those people that aren't getting those works done will be caught and will be driven and will either lose their ability to manage their buildings and all of the income generated from it, or will need to get those works done. So, so the pathway to making those buildings safe for the resident is there. Now, the pathway for holding those responsible for account, I accept, is harder, right? Uh, and that's why we've created the remediation, contribution orders, and etc. Uh, but it is harder. But there is some success. I was speaking to one freeholder who was telling me they're expecting to get 80 to 90 percent of their costs back from those responsible for doing the works uh, initially. Uh, and that is through the Act. So do we want all leaseholders to be taking action against uh, those responsible? No, we want leaseholders and residents to be safe and we want the freeholders uh, and the landlords really to be taking the action against those who are responsible. Um, I wish I, I I saw it quite from the, from 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 your angle, but uh, maybe I can talk to you about some specific specific oh, examples offline. Um, I'd love to. Probably I'd not appropriate. But I'm keen to make it easier and <clears throat> quicker and simpler. Okay. So so yes, absolutely. Great. Kizzy, back to you. And then back to Alex <laughs> for her last question. Thanks, Kizzy. Um, I had one question about the Building Safety Fund. So where funding has been granted, then there's an obligation in the funding agreement that the responsible entity that receives the funding has to take all reasonable steps to recover the cost of the remedial works from those responsible through, well, either through insurance claims or against those responsible through legal action against the original delivery team. So that might include claims under the original contracts or collateral warranties or third party rights or claims under the Defective Premises Act. Um, 
And the guidance online says that the ministry doesn't rule out seeking an assignment of the relevant rights where it considers it appropriate to do so to pursue those costs. So the question I had is, what steps is the ministry taking to ensure that responsible entities are pursuing all those legal rights and how involved is the ministry with those claims? Yeah, look, so uh, I'd probably start off by saying it must be right that when the taxpayer is funding uh, the remediation of buildings, that those who are responsible don't get away scot-free, right? So it must be right that we go after those who are responsible for the defects. And uh, and it's only those who are contracted or, or have the contractual relationship that can take that action against those responsible for the defects, right? So, so that must be right. We are saying taxpayer funding is provided, but you must take reasonable steps to recover that money from those responsible because they mustn't be allowed to get away with it scot-free, right? That must be right. Uh, equally, it must be right that if the taxpayer uh, is funding it, that at some point, and the taxpayer feels that further action can be taken against those responsible, should have the ability to take that action. That also must be right. Then there is a question of at what point does the government decide uh, it is uh, now the right place to act uh, against certain entities. Right Now, I should say, it's not like uh, government's been standing still, right? We've had the developer contract uh, which basically got rid of all of the court cases in relation to s s large amounts of the large developers and sort of said they will pay for it, right? And not only will they pay for the cladding, they'll pay for all of the defects that make a building unsafe for residents to live in, right? So you've, you've got that, which the ministry has, has agreed with developers and we're holding them to account. In addition, we've got the recovery strategy unit which has several active cases where it's pursuing those responsible to make sure that funds are recovered and people are doing the right thing. So driving consequence into the system must also be part of the strategy alongside making sure residents are safe absolutely immediately or as quickly as, uh, as is possible. So, so Alex, I, I think the answer is we are doing it, uh, but it's an, you know, it can't be in every single case. Uh, and we do expect everyone to do their part. Okay. Great. Thanks, Chandru. And that is the end of the time that we've got with you, which is a shame because I've got lots more questions. Um, and I know that we've got questions on our chat as well. Um, so we will pick those up with you separately. Thank you to everybody who put questions in. And I'm sorry that we've not had time to cover those. Um, but we will um, we'll raise them with you separately, Chandru, if that's okay. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's been it's been really interesting. I've really enjoyed it. And I hope everybody else listening and watching has enjoyed it too. Um, if anybody um, watching has any questions for our construction or our health and safety team, then you can get in touch by clicking on the resources tab, which should be at the bottom of your screen. And those resources include our new building safety hub, our virtual pop-up service, and our building safety training course. So thank you very much for watching and Chandri, thank you again very much. Thank you for inviting me. And I feel I've let Richard down the most. <laughs> so I'm sorry, Richard. Don't worry, we all feel like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank, thank you. So